What is my perfect crime? I break into Tiffany's at midnight. Do I go for the vault? No, I go for the chandelier. It's priceless. As I'm taking it down, a woman catches me. She tells me to stop. It's her father's business. She's Tiffany. I say no. We make love all night. In the morning, the cops come and I escape in one of their uniforms. I tell her to meet me in Mexico, but I go to Canada. I don't trust her. Besides, I like the cold. Thirty years later, I get a postcard. I have a son, and he's the chief of police. This is where the story gets interesting. I tell Tiffany to meet me in Paris by the Trocadero. She's been waiting for me all these years. She's never taken another lover. I don't care. I don't show up. I go to Berlin. That's where I stash the chandelier. Time I was ringing up a dad and son, and the first thing I noticed about them is they were both wearing t-shirts with fish on them, so I knew they were probably used to catching shit, and I was definitely not about to let them catch an attitude. So the dad stopped me as I was ringing things up and he said, whoa, 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 that's supposed to be on sale. And I was like, oh, okay, just let me rescan it. And so I rescanned it and the price was just like my weight. It just wasn't getting any lower. So I looked at him and I was like, this price is stagnant. And he was like, okay, we'll get someone else over here. So my coworker came over and she scanned the item and manually entered the item number and the price just wasn't moving. And then the dad decided to elbow the son and go, ha ha, how many women does it take to scan an item? And then he elbowed him again and decided to repeat the joke. And I was just sitting there like, dang, you about to bruise his ribs. So then the dad took us to where he saw the sale sign and lo and behold, there was a sale sign, but it was for a completely different product. So I looked at him and I said, see, this sign is actually for a different product as you can see printed on here. And then I elbowed my coworker and said, haha, how many men does it take to read a sign? I think it's funny when men are like, oh, I could never date a girl that wears too much makeup. You do realize that blank canvases at Michael's are like 30 bucks, but when they're actually painted on, they can go for millions. It's the same shit, baby. I'm a fucking Picasso. So in case you haven't noticed, I love my job. And here is one of the main reasons why. Today, like, the trucker version of Hulk walks in, just this big burly dude, and he goes, Hey kid, like, I don't know what to get, like, what do you recommend? And I was like, Oh, sir, for you, I definitely recommend the pink lemonade tea. And he goes, Oh, that sounds kind of fruity. And before my brain could be like, Hey Maddie, you're at work. Don't make comments like you're about to make. I go, Oh, well, sir, I'm fruity. This poor man. He goes, oh, well, what, what does that mean? I was like, oh, I just really like fruit. And so he goes, you know what? Let me try it. I was like, okay. And so I make him the drink and this is what he does. You know, kid, I think I might be fruity too. Ah. Sir, that's not what fruity means, but I didn't have the heart to tell him it was so pure. Last winter, me and my three friends, we went on some big-ass road trip, but we had to be back by Tuesday because we were taking winter classes, and we all had the same math test that day. So we were at some log cabin, and we drank a little too much, and no one wanted to take the test on Tuesday, so we all emailed the professor Monday night. We all emailed him the same lie, saying that while we were on the road trip, we got a flat tire Monday night, and we weren't able to make the test on Tuesday, so if we could, can we please take it on Wednesday? So the professor emailed us back, saying, yeah, no problem, take the test on Wednesday, stuff happens, I understand. So the four of us walk into math class that morning to take the test, and um, we're all happy that our lie worked and this and that. So he gives us the test, and he puts us in four separate rooms, which I didn't care. It's just to prevent cheating. So I take the test, and it's out of 100 points. The first question worth five points was, what's 10 divided by 2? And I'm like, this is easy. It's 5. The second question was worth 95 points was, which tire was flat? So when I was a little kid, my mom made me go to this funeral of a friend of hers who passed away who I didn't know at all, actually. I was probably eight or nine years old at the time or something, and I was really, really bored. And so for the duration of the funeral, I literally just sat in the back of a corner and didn't talk to anybody or do anything. Or After the funeral, when everyone was walking out, this guy walks by me and he stops and he looked down at me and I'm just sitting kind of in the corner minding my own business. And he goes, enjoy your life. I didn't enjoy mine, and look where I am now. I'm sad and miserable. And he, like, patted me on the head and walked away, and I was like, that was weird. My mom comes to me, and she's like, look, I know you don't care about who this is or anything, but this is my friend, so at least go look in the casket and say goodbye. So I was like, fine, whatnot, and so I make my way over to the casket. I look in. See, the same guy that just said goodbye to me. I couldn't sleep for months. You know what it ended up being? The guy had a twin. Nobody thought that, like, mm, I was traumatized. <laughs> this is why you should never try using a Ouija board. My friends and I decided to play with a Ouija board after work in our office and spoke to a girl named Quinn. She didn't say much but seemed friendly enough, but when I mentioned my girlfriend, she got super mad and protective of me. When it got to 2am, we said goodbye to her. 
But about a week later, in the middle of the night, the office block that we worked in burnt down. It creeped us all out, so a week later we used the Ouija board again near a lake and asked for Quinn. When we got through to her, we asked if she started the fire, to which she responded, yes. About two weeks later, I was driving to my girlfriend's house with the board in the back of the truck. I didn't know it at the time, but my girlfriend was in fact cheating on me. But I guess Quinn knew because I lost control of the truck and flipped it upside down. When the cops arrived to make sure I was okay, they reminded me what road I was on. Route 666, Virginia. I got stuck in the massive snowstorm yesterday, but I didn't panic because when I was young, my dad always told me if you're ever stuck, just wait for a plow truck to pass by and follow it and eventually you'll get the safety. So there was a good foot of snow on the ground and finally a plow truck passed me and I followed it for a good 45 minutes. So after some time, the driver of the plow, he got out of his truck, came to my window and he asked me why I was following him. And I explained it to him what my dad told me and he understood. So then the driver goes, well, I'm all done plowing the Walmart parking lot. You want to follow me to Best Buy? This is why you should always sleep with your lights on. In 1991, a man named Christopher Case was found dead in his bathtub, fully clothed in the fetal position. When police interviewed his best friend, Sammy, she told them about a very disturbing phone call she got from him the night before he died. On the call, he told her that the previous night, he had woken up to what sounded like whispering coming from underneath his bed. When he went to look, he couldn't move. As he laid helplessly, he watched a black figure pull itself out from underneath his bed. Once it was fully upright, it reached down and began choking him until he passed out. The next morning when he came to, he felt his neck and it was swollen and bruised. And then he saw blood on his hands and he saw that there were deep, uniform incisions on each of his fingertips. As he's saying all this to Sammy and telling her how scared he is to go to bed that night, he suddenly stops and he says, I hear whispering outside my room. Then the phone went dead. Last year, I actually went to the Super Bowl to go see the 49ers versus the Chiefs. And I walk into the stadium and every seat is taken. It was a sold out Super Bowl. So as the game is being played, I realize that the only open seat in the whole entire stadium is the one behind me. And I couldn't get over the fact that how is this seat not taken? It's the Super Bowl. So I wanted to find out why that seat was empty. So I asked the guy sitting next to us, I said, excuse me, sir, how come that seat next to you is empty? And he goes, well, um, to be honest with you, that seat belonged to my wife. And every year for the past five years, we've been going to the Super Bowl. But this year she died and she couldn't make it. I was like, oh, my God, I'm so sorry to hear that, sir. Um, Enjoy the game. But out of curiosity, don't you have like a family member or a friend you could have bring? And he goes, yeah, I have plenty of friends, plenty of family, but they all went to the funeral today. The weirdest thing just happened to me. and I don't know what to do. My girlfriend and her sister and I were eating breakfast at her house. And my girlfriend just gets up and goes to the bathroom. So while my girlfriend's in the bathroom, her sister starts trying to convince me to take her upstairs and like do things with her. Her sister takes my hand and starts guiding me upstairs. And as she's walking up the stairs, she's taking off her underwear. She takes her underwear and just throws it at my face. And I immediately sprint to my car. So I open the front door to get to my car. And my girlfriend's already outside and she's crying. She's like, oh my God, I knew you were the right guy. I knew you wouldn't sleep with my sister. This was just a big test and you passed. I had a completely blank face while my girlfriend celebrated because in reality, I was going back to my car to get condoms. So you pull